Hello and welcome back. So today I want to continue talking about PLL circuits by looking at one of their most important applications, that being frequency multiplication. Now you can get frequency multiples starting from a base frequency using analog techniques, so distortion and filtration, but what makes a PLL special is that it can work over a very wide frequency range without changing the circuit and it can also change the output frequency dynamically. So you don't need to change anything in the circuit, you can run it at multiple frequencies and change the frequencies in real time. So if you're curious about how a PLL can be used for this purpose and what sort of use cases are there for this sort of application, then keep watching. So first of all, why do you need frequency multiplication? I mean, you can build an oscillator at basically any frequency you want, and if you want to have the frequency set very, very precisely, you can stabilize the oscillator using a quartz crystal. Well, there are a few issues with this. First of all, a quartz crystal, or an oscillator for that matter, will provide a single unique output frequency. If you want a different output frequency, you need to change the quartz crystal. And for a digital circuit especially, you don't want to have your board filled up with quartz crystals. Those are expensive components and they fill up quite a lot of board space. So commonly, a digital circuit or a digital IC will have a single quartz crystal as a reference clock. And speaking of clocks, in modern day digital circuitry, you don't just need a single clock, you need multiple clocks at the same time, running at different frequencies and all intersynchronized. So you can have different blocks of your circuit running at different frequencies, but all of these need to be able to intercommunicate. And if you would be building different oscillators, you're going to have to somehow synchronize them all together. And that's not something that's very easy to do. Now, there's another big problem with quartz crystals, and that is the frequency at which they can actually work at. Now, looking at the operating principle of a quartz crystal, it's basically a mechanical resonator that physically resonates based on the physical dimensions of the quartz crystal. So there's a limit to just how small you can cut your crystal to provide an accurate oscillating frequency. So the fundamental frequency of most commercially available quartz crystals is limited to about 30-40 MHz. Now, it is worth mentioning that there are some quartz crystals that rely on frequency multiples of their fundamental, which can go up to a few MHz, but most digital circuits nowadays, say your laptop or your phone or your PC, can work into the gigahertz range. So you can't really make an oscillator based on a quartz crystal that works at such high frequencies. So you need some method to take your precise low frequency, low frequency of your quartz, multiply it to get to the very high frequencies that are needed in modern day circuitry. So one of the main use cases for the PLL frequency multiplier is to take a low frequency from a quartz crystal based oscillator multiply it to provide a higher frequency that is just as precise as your initial base frequency. So you can take something like a 10 MHz oscillator and go up to the gigahertz range using a PLL frequency multiplier. So now, to understand how a PLL can be used to multiply the frequency of a signal, let's quickly remember how the PLL is built. So we have a signal at certain frequency going into a phase detector there's low pass filter which I emitted today, then it goes into a voltage controlled oscillator and then the loop is closed back through the phase detector. Now the output frequency of the system, if you leave it as it is, is the exact same frequency as the input. So no frequency multiplication occurs if it, you leave it like this. Now to understand how we can change the output frequency, we need to remember that to get the loop stable, we need to have two signals of the same frequency going into the phase detector. The phase detector cannot detect the phase of two signals if their frequency is different. So if we want to have a different frequency at the output than we have at the input, we need to do something with that signal to get it to the same frequency as our input signal. So basically, we need a block that can divide the frequency of a signal. 
So what we need is a counter circuit. A circuit that will count pulses and only output a pulse when a certain number of input pulses have occurred. And now this sort of circuit can be built to divide by any number. So you can have division by 2, 3, 4, so any integer number. And by adding this, we can obtain an output frequency, which is the input frequency times this division rate. So we can multiply the input frequency by an integer number. Now, it's worth mentioning that to get this system to work, we need a few practical considerations to take into account regarding the phase detector and the voltage controlled oscillator. So because we can set any value in certain limits with our division circuit, our voltage controlled oscillator needs to be able to work over a very wide frequency range. So to build this type of PLL, the voltage controlled oscillator will most likely be a relaxation oscillator. You can't really get such a huge frequency interval using a varica based oscillator. Secondly, if we now turn to the phase detector, because we can have such wide frequency variations, this phase detector needs to be able to handle large frequency differences on the input. So even multiples of our initial frequency. Secondly, in this sort of system where we have a very clean, very clear clock, noise immunity is not that big of a concern. And it's also worth mentioning that our signals will not necessarily be square waves running at 50%. Based on how the division circuit is built, you can have duty cycles other than 50%. And for all these reasons, our phase detector needs to be a type 2 phase detector. You can't build this sort of system with a type 1 phase detector. Now, there's one more thing to consider. So with this circuit, we can get integer frequency multiples. So if we start with, say, 1 MHz, we can go to 2, 3, 4, 5 MHz, and so on. But what if we want a fractional ratio of our output frequency in reference to our input. Say we want to go from 1 MHz to 1.33 MHz, or some other similar value. Well, the key to this is the usage of either pre- or post-scalers, or well, both of them. Basically, what these are are counter circuits added before our phase lock loop, so the pre-scaler, or a counter circuit added at the end of the phase lock loop called a post scaler. And now the output frequency will be our input frequency multiplied by the ratio by which the PLL multiplies and divided by the number by which our scalers are dividing the signal. So basically, if I want to obtain 1.33 MHz out of 1 MHz, it's important to notice that 1.33 is 4 over 3 times 1 MHz so I need to multiply by 4, divide by 3, and then I get my 1.33. In a similar fashion, depending on what ratios are set, with these counter circuits, you can theoretically get any frequency. So you can get this sort of PLL plus division circuitry to provide very precise frequencies over a very wide range with very small increments. So you're not just limited to multiples of your initial frequency, you can go to basically any frequency you want. And it's also important to notice that when you're running this sort of system, well, you can work with your initial frequency, you can work with the signal running after the prescaler, you can work with the one running after the PLL, and you can work with the one running after the postscaler. So you have already four different frequencies at the same time intersynchronized. And this is basically how you will build a nice large clock tree. By using all sorts of these division and multiplication blocks, you can get any frequency you want synchronized with all the other frequencies in your system. Ah, looks a bit complicated. Let's see if this actually works on a practical board now. So the circuit that I will be working with today looks something like this. So we got our three main blocks. We have a prescaler, the PLL, and the postscaler. And then inside the PLL, we also have this internal division counter block. So let's look at these one at a time. So we have our input signal going into the prescaler or bypassing it. So I have this jumper selection element where we can either select the signal to go through or to bypass the prescaler. The prescaler is a simple divide by free counter built with dual JK flip-flops. 
Then in the PLL section, I'm using the CD4046 IC as a PLL, and then the counter is a is a 748C4040 counter blocks, circuit that can divide by powers of 2, so 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. Again, I have a jumper assembly to select between different division rates. And finally, at the output of the PLL, we have another counter circuit, the post scaler, again with jumpers to select to either bypass it or not. This again is the same circuit as we used in the pre-scaler, so we can divide by 3 or we can not divide by anything. And of course, to see all of the signals at the same time, we have the input jack, we have a connector after the pre-scaler, one after the PLL, and one after the post-scaler. So we'll be able to monitor all of the signals at the same time. And now other than the ICs themselves, I also did a set of decoupling capacitors, one for each of the ICs. So there's four main ICs on this board. So now let's see it in action. So let's start our measurements off by looking at each individual block, how it works. So what I got here is, well, the board with the four B and C connectors, so the input signal and the three outputs, I got my power supply running at almost five volts now, and then I got my oscilloscope, and then a bunch of B and C cables. So now I have my input signal coming from the signal generator, which is behind the table. It's going through the external trigger pin, so this is the one of the very few occasions in which I actually found a use for this. And from there, it's going into the board, but through these T junctions, it's also going into the first channel of the oscilloscope. So right now, what we're seeing is a 50 kilohertz square wave, a five volt amplitude square wave that I'm using to run the circuit. So first block to look at, going through the first BNC, is our prescaler. So if I quickly activate this, we see that there's quite a blur in there, but but if I just select a single capture, we see our division by three action. So for every three pulses on the input, so on the yellow, we have one pulse on the blue. And now an interesting thing to observe here is that the duty cycle after the prescaler is not 50%. So if the division rate would have been something that is a multiple of two, most likely you could have gotten the duty cycle of 50%. But if you have this sort of division by an odd number, you will not get your 50% duty cycle. So this is a clear example of why your type 2 phase detector is mandatory. So now if we move on, what I changed was I took the first channel to go after the prescaler, so at the input of the PLL, and now the second oscilloscope channel is going to the output of the PLL. So we can see now in yellow our input signal, so the 33% duty cycle coming out of the prescaler, and then in blue we have the output of the PLL, and in this case it's configured to multiply by 4. So based on the jumper position, for every pulse on the yellow, we get 4 pulses on the blue. So if I now move around the jumper a bit, so right now I selected the PLL to multiply by only 2, so we can see only 2 pulses on the blue, and in a similar fashion, let's just move this around a bit to make it more clear, I can select 8 or even more pulses. So we can set our PLL just by changing the position of the jumper to provide any multiplication frequency. Another interesting thing to look at is what's going on inside of the PLL circuit. So what I got here is the input signal in yellow, the output signal in blue is at a frequency 8 times larger than the input, but if we look at what's coming out of the division circuit, so the counter circuit, which is dividing this signal by eight times, we see that it's a 50% duty cycle signal. So our phase detector is comparing our input signal running at 33% duty cycle with the signal coming from the counter circuit, which is running at 50% duty cycle. And there's no issues with this. So the PLL can handle this based on how the two input signals are being compared. There's a certain signal coming out of the phase detector's output. So for some reason, there's a bit of an oscillation going on in the output of the phase detector. But anyway, if we look after the low pass filter, there's a clean signal. So all of those oscillations or whatever noise was going on completely disappeared. So it's filtered out into 
a straight line. And the circuit works stably. So now finally, we can look at our post scaler. So again, a circuit that divides by three. In yellow, we see the output of the PLL. And in blue, we see the output of the post scaler. So we can see that for every three pulses coming out of the PLL, we get one pulse out of the post scaler. Again, with a 33% duty cycle. So all three blocks are working correctly. Now there's one more important thing to look at, and that is how all of the signals look at the same time. Now, since my oscilloscope doesn't have enough channels, I resorted to a logic analyzer. So I'm taking advantage of the analog discovery, not just for the signal generator part, but also for the logic inputs. So I'm probing the input signal, the one after the prescaler, the one after the PLL, and the one after the postscaler, all at the same time. So if we look at how this looks, and we make a screenshot, there we go, so we stopped everything, we can now more clearly see how all of the circuits interact at the same time. So we see our input signal, then we see our prescaler, which is dividing the input signal by three, so we see for every three pulses we get one pulse on the prescaler. We can also check our duty cycle, so we can see our nice 33% duty cycle, 16.66 kilohertz, and before we had 50 kilohertz, so 50 divided by 3 is 16.66. Now we got our PLL, which multiplies this signal coming out of the prescaler by 8. So for every pulse on the prescaler, we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 pulses. Of course, different multiplication ratios could have been set. And up until this point, all our signals are nicely edge aligned. Well, the PLL has a falling edge aligned with the rising edge of the prescaler, and well, I would have needed an extra inverting stage, which I forgot to add, so it looks like this. And finally, we take our PLL signal, which is running at 133 kilohertz, so this is eight times the 16.66, and we run it through our postscaler. So again, for every three pulses of the PLL output, we get one pulse on the postscaler. And here again, we see our 33% duty cycle and 44.48 kilohertz. And now again, the scalar signal is edge aligned with the PLL output. So as I said, if the PLL output would have been inverted, then all four of these signals would have been nicely edge aligned. And that's exactly what you want in a complex clock system. You will need multiple clock signals running at different frequencies, but all inter aligned. So, in the end, based on how the circuit is built, you can obtain, at least in theory, any frequency possible. And this is quite useful, so the feature to set any frequency and to also be able to set it dynamically in the multiple circuits. So, for example, in something like a computer, it's quite useful to be able to set a dynamic clock frequency so that when you have no load, so the computer is staying in idle, you can reduce clock frequency, but when there's a complex task to perform, increase the frequency so that it can be performed faster. On the other hand, in something like signal generator, you can have a base reference clock, so which is very precise and which is either set internally or from an external more precise source, and from that obtain any frequency you want. And all of this can be achieved using PLL circuits to multiply the frequency, and external division circuits, counter circuits to divide the frequency. And with that being said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.